So let's take a look at section 14.3, which is a section on partial derivatives. Our goals for this section are to be able to compute partial derivatives, to interpret partial derivatives geometrically, to be able to estimate partial derivatives based on contour plots, and also to be able to calculate higher order partial derivatives. Um, and we're going to see a result called Clairaut's theorem. So let's start with our motivating piece, and we're going to describe the slope of multivariable functions. Suppose that you're this little person standing on this hill, and this hill represents our multivariable function, where our z-axis is going upwards, z, and our xy-axis is down somewhere on the ground, right underneath this hill. And if I'm this little person and I want to know what is the slope of this hill, that's sort of an undefined question because if I walk this way, maybe this hill isn't very steep, but if I go straight up the hill, the hill is much steeper. The way that we define uh, the partial derivative is to define what if I were to walk exactly in an x direction holding my y value constant. So let's say if I were to project where this little guy lands down here on the xy plane. This is his coordinate in terms of x and y. And then he's going to walk along a straight line parallel to the x-axis, holding his y value exactly constant. So he would be walking down this mountainside in this direction. He's taking a slice of the mountain. And the slice of the mountain exactly aligns with this curve where my y value is held constant at whatever my y value is. And I want to know what is the slope of the, this line right at this place. And that describes what a partial derivative with respect to x is. That's my motivation. Let's formalize what that looks like with some formal language. So here we see that a partial derivative with respect to x is the rate of change of a function with respect to x holding other variables constant. And in this case, our only other variable was y, so we hold our y value constant. Our formal definition of limit for that, our notation f sub x tells us that we're taking the partial derivative with respect to x, and we're looking at that partial derivative at the point a, b. That's going to be given by the limit as h approaches 0 of f of a plus h comma b minus f of a all over h. Again, this looks really similar to our limit definition in single variable. The difference is, notice that our y value b is not having a limit value h associated with it, meaning that we're looking at smaller and smaller increments only in the x direction and the y direction is held constant. Let's visualize this. given a graph. So let's say this is my, oh, you can't see that. Let's say this is my x coordinate, my y coordinate, and my z coordinate, and I have, this is my representation of some multivariable function, so it's some curvy space up here in three space. And what we're looking at, if I have my point a, b, down in the x, y plane, and I want to know what the partial derivative with respect to x is, it means that I hold my y values constant, and I'm looking at the slope of the tangent line that's traced out as my y value stays constant. So when I take this y value is constantly at b, I'm projecting it up onto my three-dimensional surface, it's going to be some curvy line, and I want to know what is the slope of the tangent line right at that point a, b, f of a, b. And so I can think of, here is my a plus h value, if this is my a value. As I move forward a small h amount, I want to know what is my rate of change, essentially, because I'm leaving my y values constant. Let's summarize that. So in summary, if we look at the vertical trace where y equals b, we say that our partial derivative f sub x of a, b is the slope of the tangent line 
at the vertical trace y equals b. And we can approximate this by looking at the change in z over change in x while holding our y constant. So here's another way to visualize this. Instead of looking at a three-dimensional plot, let's go ahead and look at a contour plot. Remember, here we go, I'm trying to focus. There we go. A contour plot is a top view. So suppose I'm looking down at the xy plane and each of these level curves is tracing out a different z value. And in this case, this level curve is labeled zero. And as I go up each level curve, they're going up by units of 10. If I want to estimate my partial derivative just from looking at the contour plot, say we're interested in the partial derivative at this point, we're going to call this point a, b. And I want to know what is f sub x of a, b. That's asking, what's my rate of change in the x direction holding my y value constant at b? So holding my y value constant at b, as I move along in this direction, I see that, let's say I move one unit, a plus one, how high am I going up? And I see that if I move over one unit in the x direction, I'm going up about five units in the z direction because I'm between my level curve where z equals zero and my level curve where z equals 10. So my partial derivative with respect to x can be approximated by my rate of change in the z direction by the rate of change in my x direction, holding my y value constant at b. And in this case, it's going to be about equal to my z's are going up by about 5 as my x values are going up by about 0. So I would say that that's 5. Notice that we can do the same estimation only in the y direction, and that's our partial derivative with respect to y. All of the previous de definitions are the same, except we're flip-flopping what's changing. So my partial derivative with respect to y at the point a, b is going to be my change in z divided by my change in y. And in this case, when I draw the picture, it means that I'm keeping my x value constant at a, and my y value is changing. It's going from b to b plus 1. And we see as I go one unit up in the y direction, my z values are going from the level curve where z equals 0 up to the level curve where z equals 10. So that's approximated by a change in z value of 10 and a change in y value of one unit, which is 1, which is equal to 10. I say that these are approximations because, in fact, the actual partial derivative is going to be the limit. I look at this as as my vector here is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. I'm looking at the rate of change more and more and more accurately until I get right at that point. If I evaluate the actual partial derivative at a, b, it's going to give me just the slope of the tangent line right at that point rather than the approximation over this one unit of distance. So we just saw two geometric approaches to computing partial derivatives. Now let's look at some actual computation. In this example, let's look at f of xy is equal to 4 minus x squared minus y squared. My partial derivative with respect to x, f sub x, is going to be the derivative of this function, treating my y value as constant. And so when I look at this derivative, the derivative of 4 is 0. Maybe I'll write that down to be really explicit. The derivative of x squared is going to be negative 2x, just by polynomial rule. The derivative of y squared is just going to be 0. Why is it 0? It's 0 because we're treating y as constant. And I'm going to emphasize that y is constant. So just like the derivative of 4 being 0, in this case, the y term just goes to 0. And it turns out my partial derivative with respect to x is going to be negative 2x. Similarly, if I wanted to compute my partial derivative with respect to y, my derivative with respect to 4 is 0. My derivative of x squared is also going to be 0 because in this case, I'm treating my x as a constant. The only thing that's changing is my y values. And my derivative of negative y squared be becomes negative 2y. So in this case, I'm treating x as constant.
that's a really simplistic uh, uh, example. If I wanted to, I could also evaluate my partial derivatives at a given point. So if I wanted to know what the partial derivative with respect to x at the point 1, 1, that would mean I would plug into my partial derivative here where x equals 1 and y equals 1. There's no y in this function, and I get negative 2 times 1, which is equal to negative 2. So the slope, when I fix my y value exactly equal to 1 along this curve, is going to be negative 2. Finally, let's take a look at some notation. The notation that I've been using up until now is Newtonian notation, my f sub x indicating a partial derivative with respect to x, which holds y constant. That can also be written as df dx, but these d's are curly d's. They're actually deltas. Um, and this is an alternate notation that means the same thing, the partial derivative with respect to x. I can also write my notation as the partial derivative with respect to y. Why would I want to use this notation? Sometimes it's helpful to think about it this way when doing multiple partial derivatives. So that's my final topic. Let's say that I want to take the partial derivative with respect to x twice. That means I'm taking the partial derivative with respect to x and then a partial derivative with respect to x again. The notation for that is a little bit trickier. It's d squared of f divided by dx squared. Similarly, the partial derivative with respect to y twice looks like this. I'll do an example in a second. And finally, I don't have to do it just with the same variable over and over again. If I wanted to, I could do a partial derivative with respect to y and then a partial derivative with respect to x. But here is where the tricky part comes. Um, the tricky part is in this notation, the x's and the y's reverse. This is telling me I do my partial with respect to y first and then x. And this notation, I have a dx dy on bottom. So note that this order changes. That's maybe a star. Note that the order changes. Why is that? If I wanted to, it's because of composition of functions is my short answer, that really on the outside of this, I'm taking the partial derivative with respect to x. But what's going on first is I'm taking the partial derivative with respect to y. And when you have this notation in your head, it makes sense that these variables would be put in the order that they are. I'm doing my partial derivative with respect to y first, and then outside of that, I take the partial derivative with respect to x. And that aligns with what this notation is telling me. y goes first, and then x. Similarly, I could do x first, and then y, or I could do any order of variables that I want. So to make this a little clearer, let's take a look at an example. Let's say that I have a really messy function. Let's pull this up. So this really messy function has a lot of different variables. We haven't talked about four variable functions, but algebraically there's no reason why we couldn't. And let's say that this function is given by x, y squared plus z, w cubed. Messy function, lots of variables. And I want to look at what's the partial derivative of this function with respect to x and then with respect to y. So I'm going to do a little bit of scratch work. My partial derivative with respect to x um, maybe I, I can suppress this notation. I don't have to tell you that all of these variables are in here. What am I going to do? My partial with respect to x means that I treat every single other variable as if it were a constant. So this zw term, those are just constants. This y squared is also a constant. So what's the derivative of x? It's equal to 1. And thinking of this as a constant, it means it's like a coefficient out front. And I end up with y squared, and this whole term drops off because it's a constant. That's my partial derivative with respect to x. Now, I want to take my partial derivative of this function with respect to y, which is written f of x, y. And what's my derivative of this function with respect to y? That's boring. That's just 2y. As another illustrative example, Suppose we wanted to do it differently. I want to take my partial derivative with respect to y and then with respect to x. What does that look like? Well, again, because my y is in the interior, I'm going to take my partial derivative with respect to y. So I'm going to treat all of these other variables as constant. The derivative of y squared is 2y, 
x is like a coefficient out front. You could think of it as the number 3, something like that. And so when I take the derivative of that, I'm going to have 2 times the coefficient out front x times y plus 0, because this whole term drops out because it's a constant. And now I'm going to take the partial derivative of this new function with respect to x, treating x as the variable, y as a constant. I can think of that as a coefficient. The derivative of x is equal to 1, and I'm left with just 2y. Haha! -ha. This is one example that does not prove the general case, but it is, in fact, the general case. I don't think I have a sheet that says this. This is Clairaut's theorem. Clairaut's theorem states, um, so Clairaut's theorem states that if f sub xy and f sub yx are both continuous functions on some domain d, then the mixed partial f sub xy is going to be equal to the mixed partial f sub y a x for all points on that domain d. Notice I introduced a word f sub xy we sometimes call the mixed partial, short for mis mixed partial derivative because it's mixing both of the input variables x's and y's. And we didn't prove this theorem but we saw one example of when that theorem holds.